Okay, thank you. So uh, I've been asked first to talk a little bit about myself, but before I do that, I'm going, just going to put uh, something here. That's uh, either a letter or a number, right? Zero? What does zero mean? Nothing? Right? Nothing? Maybe? But if I put this one over here, it potentiates that one. Now we have 10. Uh, so how can nothing turn into something? And not only that, you add another nothing, and then you have even more. So when the concept of zero first came into the, uh, the world in Italy for a short time, it was outlawed because the Catholic Church thought it was evil. I don't know what year that was. That's how we're going to start, and we're going to come back to zero and nothing. Okay. So first about myself, um, I'm a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine. I also practice Chinese martial arts, and um, I got into Chinese medicine kind of accidentally, being at the right place at the right time. In 1971, the President Nixon formalized relations with the People's Republic of China. So all you guys, you have grown up in a world where China is this country, and you can read about China on the news. And when I was younger, maybe a little bit younger than you, uh, you never heard anything about China, nothing. And uh, China was not a country that communicated with the rest of the world. And there was this communist uh, perceived threat between China and Russia and the West, because they're both communist countries. And President Nixon at the time thought that uh, he would drive a wedge between China and Russia by formalizing relationship with China, and um, it actually worked. The one thing Nixon did right, maybe. <laughs> well, he started the, the environment. He started the environmental uh, EPA. Yeah, I think he did that, too. So anyways, so they, they had this big to-do, and they went over to China, and um, with Kissinger, who was the Secretary of State at the time, to formalize the relations, and all the reporters were there. So there was a journalist who needed an emergency appendectomy, and that emergency appendectomy was done using acupuncture to complement the anesthesia. So they used a tiny bit of anesthesia, and they used a lot of acupuncture. And his name was James Reston. And um, long time after, I think in the 90s, he wrote a book about his experience there. But when that happened, this uh, notion of acupuncture was big news in the United States. It was the cover story of all the newspapers. Uh, there was no internet then, right? So newspapers, magazines, and I was fascinated by those stories. Every story I could find that talked about acupuncture or Chinese medicine, I found it and read it, and then I just shelved it. It wasn't, um, that was it, it was over with. So then, um, I had this interest in philosophy, so my main interest is philosophy. And to um, as an extension of my interest in philosophy, I started studying martial arts in Boston. You may get from my accent that I once lived in Boston. Right? So um, I was doing martial arts in Boston with a teacher from China. And then in um, 1976, Dr. So came from Hong Kong wanting to teach Chinese medicine to Americans, and nobody would listen to him. So he went to Harvard, he went to all the medical schools, he went to medical schools out west, and Dr. So and my Chinese martial art teacher came from neighboring villages in Canton or Guangzhou. And Dr. So used to come over and hang out at the school. And I got to know Dr. So. So 
I, I came to class one day and there was a little piece of paper, you know, Dr. So was going to teach Chinese medicine. And he had uh, three Harvard graduate students that were going to help him organize it. And it was, wasn't expensive at all. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that because Chinese medicine is really an extension of a deeper philosophy. And I thought it would help me um, get a deeper understanding of Chinese philosophy. So, and I, I did his program. I never ever thought I'd be a practicing, a medical practitioner. And uh, I did his program. I finished it in 1980. And now suddenly Dr. So is considered the father of Chinese medicine in the United States. And quickly, uh, the public wanted Chinese medicine. So I came up to Vermont in 1986, not because I was going to do Chinese medicine, but because I was going to be a farmer. And I worked on a farm. And there was a person, a fellow worker, who had a hurt back. And after watching them for two weeks, I said, you know, I might be able to help you because I know some acupuncture. And so I did. And that was in 1987. And after that, it's been a nonstop a uh, flood of people wanting my services, so maybe someday I'll be a farmer. <laughs> so, um, Chinese medicine is, is based on a paradigm. So some of you I know have been in a, are, are in a complementary medicine class. Um, Taoism, do, do you guys know what Taoism is? I'll write it up here. So, it should be spelled with a D, D-A-O-I-S-M. But sometimes the D is spelled with a T. It's the same thing. You guys familiar with that? Taoist philosophy is naturalist philosophy that originated in China, or maybe more precisely, East Central Asia. And just a little bit, a little note about when you see Chinese words, so there's a D here and the T here, and, and later I'm going to write the word Qi, or write it right now, which is a Q and an I, but you see it's spelled C-H-I. What, what's going on there? So two things going on there. One is that in the Chinese language, more sounds are made than in the English language. So they have a soft CH and a hard CH and a soft D or a soft T and a hard T. So when you see a D, it's a soft T. When you see a T, it's a very aspirated, strong T. And when you learn the language, the way you learn to make that, you have to hold a, a candle here. And when you say Taoism, um, you have to blow the candle out, then you've said it correctly. Um, and, and the reason it's, it ended up with a CHI and a T is because the, the first institutions to uh, transliterate the Chinese language into English was done between Harvard and Yale um, around the, the late 1800s, right? And they didn't understand the nuance in, uh, in the language. And it was actually the Chinese in the 1960s that told the West that you're not saying using our language correctly. And they gave us the T, you know, the D and the T like that. So Taoism is sometimes called Chinese naturalist philosophy. It's a philosophy based on nature, and it's it's based on this concept of a Tao. So, you know, I'd like to engage you guys if possible. What, what, what is the Tao? Yeah, it literally translates to way. It also literally translates to street. So, what way? So, you can, uh, what's the street up here? Uh, I don't know, Pearl Street? So, if it was written in Chinese sign, it would say Pearl Tao Street. But when you're using the word Tao with reference to a, the philosophy and you hear the word way, it simply means the way in which things work. 
just the way in which things work. And maybe more precisely, how do things work inside me? How does my mind work? How does my body work? So it's based on nature. How does nature work? So the first idea that we have from Taoist philosophy is that before we had this created universe, there was nothing. Can you imagine that? Uh, do you know what a koan is? A koan is a Buddhist riddle that may or may not have an answer, but the contemplation of it helps to still the mind and bring your focus to a deeper place within yourself. So a koan might be what's nothing, what's, what's no reality at all, absolutely nothing. So we, we've got two processes happening here. You know, I'm standing here and I'm talking to you guys and you're listening, right? And this is the process of academia or education, right? You listen, you read, you write, you learn, you memorize. But if we sat here in silence for one hour, is it possible to learn anything? Yeah. 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 And let's say you made that a regular habit, that you sit in silence, maybe for 20 minutes, a couple of times a week. So you may leave that period of silence maybe feeling relaxed or maybe feeling like nothing has happened. But if it became a regular habit after a while, I think that you'd start to learn something. Yeah? Yeah. So back to this idea of nothing. The Taoist philosophy says that before there was anything, there was nothing, absolutely nothing. In order, how can you have something? So let's say this, this board here represents that nothing. And suddenly there's something. Suddenly there's something. There is the something right here on nothing. There's, there's a little bit of a contradiction here, right? And the contradiction is, how can you have something when the primary reality is nothing? How can that be? Because the very moment there's something, at the same time, there's a container. The something and the container arise at the same moment. And this something has the property of expansion, and the container may have a slight property of contraction, but it's simply containing that which is expanding. And possibly this is the universe, right? Maybe. The universe has a boundary, we're pretty sure, right? You know that physics has, has measured the boundary of the universe and knows that the universe is expanding and has a sense of how big the universe is. Well, I read something great about a month ago in a science, tech, uh, science place that the universe might not be expanding. There are now mathematical equations that say the universe might be being pulled by something else. That's what's causing the expansion. That's... That's something to wrap your mind around, right? So for the sake of argument here, we're going to say that th there's, there's this principle of expansion here, and there's a principle of containment. And there's an interaction. So if I take a balloon, I, I blow a balloon up, you know, and you squeeze one end and the other end gets big, and it keeps moving around. So this relationship between that which is expanding and or that which is coming into being and that which is containing that, they're actually both coming into being, right? This, the relationship between those two over time morphs into this symbol right here, which maybe you've seen before, right? <coughs> Yin-Yang symbol. Everyone know what I'm talking about? I've seen this before. You, you see it everywhere. 
And so the yin-yang symbol, you know, this, this side will be shaded here, and this whole thing will be shaded here. One is yin and one is yang. You've heard the terms yin and yang before? So we're going now, this is the very basics of Taoist philosophy. We have to start here in order to get an understanding of what she is, the concept of Chinese medicine, and how it's applied to health and healing and well-being. So this that is expanding out of nothing, we'll start another diagram here. Here's this, here's this thing that's expanding. Here's the container. They're not separate from each other, right? They're not separate. They can't be separate. Here, here they're together, right? The, the, the space, the relationship between that which is expanding and that which is containing that, that relationship right there, that is called qi. So qi is that which allows any relationship to occur, whether it's between your significant other, your family, your friends, whether it's between the clouds and the earth, whether it's between this group of people or this group of people, anything that any relationship exists because of chi. So. How many people have heard this term chi before? And oftentimes, not everyone, how about not even half, oftentimes this idea of chi is translated in English as to what? what, what do you, what's it called sometimes? If you were to translate chi into English, what would it be? Yeah. Oh, all right, that's a good one. That's not used, and it should be. But oftentimes, chi is called energy, right? Chi is called energy. And, and, and this is not accurate. Enter chi. <laughs> Enter chi. There you go. Um, chi, uh, energy is not, is, is not accurate. And, and so what I've been lobbying for a while, and other people now also, is that because this concept is unique to another culture, and we have no similar concept in our culture, the word chi should stand on its own, and we should just adopt in our culture chi. Well, if you play Scrabble, it's now, and it's actually the Oxford Dictionary has chi as its own word. So it's, it's not energy, right? It's not energy. It's that which allows what to occur. It's the relationship to occur. That's right. So in the same way that you have this expanding principle and the principle of containment happening here. The shape keeps changing, like, like that balloon that we were squeezing before. The shape keeps changing. And so we have four possibilities. We have four possibilities here. So you, you guys in the um, complementary medicine side, have you done Chinese medicine at all? No? Yes? Maybe? Uh, who, who, who here is uh, in, from that class, uh, complementary medicine? I have a wellness and alternative medicine class. Yeah. And So you, so have you done Chinese? Chinese okay. Okay. So let, let's let's create some definitions here first. So that that which is expanding from the nothing that's that's called yang. And that which is containing that expansion is called yin. You've heard the terms yin and yang before. Maybe in a pejorative way, you know, call someone a yin yang. If, but, <laughs> no. yeah, maybe that's the same thing. So, the thing with yin and the yang, 
is, is that yin and yang are not things. They, they're not material objects, nor energetic functions or properties. There's no such thing as a yang here and a yin here. Right? They're labels that are used to define a relationship. So, in the cycle of night and day, daytime is yang and nighttime is yin. And the weather, hot or warm is yang, and cold is yin. Up is yang, down is yin. Like that. So you can take any relationship. So the other thing is that sometimes when you're, you're learning about Chinese medicine from the outside, this theory of yin-yang is labeled the theory of opposites. That's not correct. And the reason it's not correct, it's because let's say today the temperature is 50 degrees. <coughs> and, um, <coughs> excuse me, let's say yesterday it was 60 degrees. All right, this is yesterday, this is today. Which, which day was yang? This, this day was yang, right? This day was yang, and this day was yin. But let's say tomorrow it's going to be 40 degrees. Now if we compare, for, we compare tomorrow with today, which day is yang? Right. Right. So, and this is yin. So what you have here is a theory of relativity, right? So the 50 degrees can be, it's yin if you compare it to yesterday, or it's yang if you compare it to tomorrow. So it is not a theory of opposites. It's a theory of relativity. So now, in Chinese literature, explaining what qi is, I have a friend who um, studies a lot because he, he, he can read Chinese well. And he said he's found over 160 definitions for qi. <laughs> so it, th 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 there's no consensus. My consensus, or my feeling, is that qi is consciousness. Because this reality that we're in, and this philosophical structure, and who knows whether this represents ultimate reality or not? You know, I, I have no idea. What's that? What is reality? Well, the first reality, well, okay, let's take that away. The question is, what's reality? Um, us, e each individual here, what, what do you... What are the three basic things? Let's try, to, let's try to identify three basic aspects to what we are. Very basic. Well, it doesn't even have to be three. It can be more. What, 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 real, real simple. What, what are we? Cells, what do you put all those cells together, what do you get? A body? <laughs> oh, you get a body, right? So we have a body, right? Remember, the question is, what's reality? Well, we have a body. Anything else? What? Mind? We have a mind. What else? Urges. Yeah, but those urges, what, do they occur in the mind? Uh, they work as families. The same way that you have cells, and the cells together are the body. So you have urges, desires, emotions. And that's all part of the mind. We'll, we'll stop it there. 
There's one more thing that makes this thing work. Yes, yeah, so, so this idea of spirit. This idea of spirit. Um, how do you know they have spirit? You know, I, I was at a function not too long ago, and this person was going off about the spirit world, and you've got to be careful of this. And I said, wait, 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 wait a second. Why do I have to be careful for spirits? What are they going to do for me? You know, the spirits better be careful for me. Right? You know, this uh, idea of the unknown and the unseen we have to uh, shy away from and think that they've got some superiority or they're going to hurt me or they're going to do something to me. You can get carried away with that, you know. Right? So remember that everything you perceive, you perceive in the mind. We could actually do away with the mind and we could just put the power of perception here. Because basically, the mind is there because of what we're perceiving, right? There's a third thing here. So, when you had this, um, this expansion principle, yang, and you had the containment yin, what was, what was, Something, something happened here. And if it didn't happen, all the matter in the universe would be as big as a pinhead. Right? The, so everything... Yeah, what are you saying? What are you saying? Yeah, and what, why? How, how do we know it's expanded? Because what's between everything? Space. Yes, it's space. And that space is... Well, here it's air. We call it air. So what if that third component were breath? And, and this is actually kind of like a, a dialogue that exists in ancient Taoist texts. You know, say, well, they're trying to, this, almost Socratic in that trying to understand what is life. There's a person walking, talking, right? And then there's that body, it's like, hmm, now it's dead. <laughs> what happened? It's no longer breathing. Right? You know, did you ever stop to think? And even if you haven't, I'm going to implant the idea now in your mind so that you can consider it in the future, that the air you're breathing now, so the air is the space between us, right? Comes in, but um, the air is this, uh, the atmosphere around the earth, right? And the atmosphere has different layers. A and then the uppermost atmosphere, layer of the atmosphere just gradually blends into the atmosphere of the solar system, right? And that gradually blends into the atmosphere of the galaxy. And that gradually blends into the atmosphere of the universe. There, there is no saran wrap. There is no wrapper around the Earth. So the air that you're breathing now literally is in connection to the edge of the universe. So I just, I just uh, explained to you a, a type of meditation where you, know, where you sit and they, one of the first instructions are pay attention to your breathing. Right? So one of the things that you do is you can affix your attention to infinity. And as you're breathing, it's, you, infinity is coming into you and you're going back out into infinity. You know, this is, this is uh, part of sitting in stillness. You know, what you can learn if you allow your mind. So, you know, when, you're, when you get angry at something or you're uh, having a, a strong emotional feeling, whether you're sad, you're happy, you're, you're compressed, you're contained within yourself, right? right? To go beyond the containment of the self and allow the, your being to be part of the universe, there is no compression of emotion, right? And you can practice that by just affixing your attention onto the air. 
in knowing that that air goes in all directions to the corners of the universe. That's an easy meditation, right? You don't, you don't need any special scriptures or, you know, all, all that stuff. You know, you can just practice. Um, I'm an avid meditator, which you might figure out by the end of the talk, yeah. Because I believe it's very useful for health. Okay, so now, reality. Mind, body, and breath. Is there anything else? This, this is where, in Taoism, where we stop. Mind, mind, body, and breath. Okay, you have the power to perceive. You've got this physical entity called the body. And you've got this air that comes in and out. That's, that's what we are. But does that define chi? I should keep track of the time. So how many people, I want to see a uh, raise of hands, have heard this concept of chi before? Yeah, so most people, many people. The picture of the needles? Oh. OK, so There's a form of medicine that developed in East Central Asia, which now we call traditional Chinese medicine. And in the 1970s, it turned the world of medical anthropology on its head because there's a, a branch of anthropology called medical anthropology. And medical anthropologists study how medicine extends itself into society. And the um, professor, Arthur Kleinemann, who may still be alive, he's a professor at Harvard, he, um, he realized that the Chinese culture have been using a form of medicine that's completely independent of Western medicine, and it works. At least it works for them. So. From, from the late 1970s to the present, the field of medical anthropology has taken kind of like a right-hand turn. And it's exploring the relationship of medicine to society in a different way, which is a very interesting field. It's something that I've recently, in the past couple of years, began to become familiar with. You know, you're sick, you go to the doctor, and they've got all these diagnostic techniques. And there's a certain um, atmosphere. There's the, the coat, the structure of the building, the language, the technology. Is that a reflection of our culture, or is our culture a reflection of that? OK. And the study of or well, the inquiry in, in medical anthropology is studying that relationship um, within different cultures or through different cultures. It's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. So in, in China, there's a form of medicine, as we call it traditional Chinese medicine, and it employs the use of multiple modalities. One is acupuncture. The other is herbal medicine. The other is diet. The other is... Uh, health, exercise. I guess that's four. And so acupuncture is the insertion of needles at precise locations in the body to affect a change in the body. And I do acupuncture every day. I stick needles in people. Um, yeah, I've, I've been doing it for almost 40 years. And uh, kind of tired of it, but um, I, I'll never stop doing it. So I've seen it work. I've seen it not work. I've seen it do some remarkable things. 
In the year 2000, I was the first acupuncturist to get privileges, hospital privileges at what was then Fletcher Allen Hospital. It's now the UVM Med Center. Well, it cost them $5 million to change that name. Maybe more. Because they, someone, some ad agency said, Fletcher Allen Hospital, that, that just doesn't sound right. UVM Med Center, that, now it sounds good. Now, now it's a reflection of our culture and society. It's a medical center attached to a university, right? So I've had privileges then, and I'm still only one of two acupuncturists that have privileges at, at the hospital there. And I've been part of the Department of Family Practice since then. They, um, since the mid-90s, I was doing acupuncture, and some doctors saw some of their patients get better when their medicine wasn't working, and they reached out to me and said, hey, you know, what do you do? And we just formed a relationship. So what I practice is traditional Chinese medicine. And yes? Hi, okay. I had a question. Um, you said you were tired of doing your job, kind of, but you want to stop at home. If you don't, you kind of get tired of it. Oh, um, so like I get tired of doing acupuncture from like 8 in the morning to 7 at night. No, I'll just reduce my hours. That's all. Yeah, yeah. The body has limitations. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I know. I gave myself yesterday some acupuncture. Yeah. Yeah. So, how does it work? The theory of acupuncture is that you put a needle in the body to affect the chi flow in the body, to affect the chi. So for a long time, the West had um, completely rejected this notion of chi. So summarily just dismissed Chinese medicine because there is no chi. But we've since, with our technology, been able to measure that your body has an electromagnetic uh, flow through it, right? The word electromagnetic are two words, so you see them together sometimes. It's magnetism, magnetism, electromagnetism, it's the same thing. So one of the, one of the four known forces in the universe, right? The four known forces in the universe are what? Gravity, strong nuclear, weak nuclear. What's the fourth one? Electromagnetism. Yes, electromagnetism. And the body has this electromagnetic flow through it. I don't have an acupuncture chart with me. So if you look at an acupuncture chart, you'll see a, you know, uh, figure with these lines on it. Those lines are called channels and they are where the chi flows. So where does the chi flow? It flows in what are called fascial planes. Well, what's a fascial plane? So you've got you've got bones, you've got muscles, you've got you know vessels, you have fluid in there. Fascial plane is I take two muscles, I put two muscles together, like the space between the muscles. I want you to find a space between the two muscles on your arm. On your forearm, you know, you feel a groove there? You feel a groove there someplace? You feel grooves there? Right? That's a fascial plane. That's where a strong flow of electromagnetic energy is. And the acupuncture points on the body are uh, within those fascial planes. Um, someone described a fascial plane in an interesting way. It's like if you, you know, take a package of, of ground meat, you know, hamburger or something, and take the two packages and put them together. Because the muscle has a layer around, like saran wrap, and they, they're together like that. The fascial plane is between them, that space in between there. That's where the electromagnetic flow is. And close to that electromagnetic flow, there's another 
organ called the interstitium. Anybody heard of the interstitium? Yes. You know anything about it? So the interstitium, we learned about the interstitium earlier this year from a paper that was published in the journal Nature. Now the interstitium is considered the largest organ in the body, not the lungs or the liver, but the interstitium. The interstitium is a continuous network of minute vessels that are part of the fascial planes. And within that interstitium, there are neurons, there's fluid, there are, there are, um, there's lymph, and um, there are signals that, um, there are neurons that carry signals between organs and between the endocrine system. This is the whole new field in science and Western medicine, understanding what this interstitium was. And if you read the articles that came out last, I think it was in April, about that, they're finally saying, now we might understand how acupuncture works. Okay? And I've always said, I've said this 30 years ago, that someday okay, acupuncture is an ancient science, that someday in the future, Western technology is going to understand how acupuncture works to a greater degree and actually improve it and make it better. And I, I still believe that's going to happen. And this theory of the interstitium is really exciting because um, we, know, we know two things already about the interstitium, right? It's where cancer mutates from one place to another, right? But it's also where the immune system is mobilized to kill cancer or to promote health. And so when we're putting needles into the interstitium, there's a science about where you put a needle according to a, a person's pulse, a person's eyes, a person's face, a person's demeanor, and the symptoms that a person presents. Okay? And this is, this is all the science of acupuncture. So the needles work. Why do the needles work? Well, you've got to plug someplace here. I think I'm just going to stick my screwdriver in this socket here. What's going to happen? We're, we're going to get some sparks, right? So uh, an acupuncture needle is metal. It's, it's steel. It's iron. It's technically surgical stainless steel. In ancient times, they started with brass. Um, I don't know when they became iron. But so you, you're putting a metal and you, you can hold a iron with a magnet, right? So you're putting this piece of metal into the interstitium with a flow of electromagnetic, electromagnetic flow, so you can influence that. Yeah. Last scanning. So you said they used to use brass needles, so they're different metals. So do you use different metals to change yeah. different types that's, of that's a, that's a very good question. And so the best metals to use are gold. And, and uh, I can't gold get... Gold not magnetic. Yes. So what you do is you use gold and silver needles together, ultimately. And um, there's, there's a science behind how to do that, but uh, I can't get gold needles anymore. They're, they're too expensive. So back, I haven't been able to get gold needles now for 15 years. So um, sometimes when I get someone that was really sick, and I think I'd say, you know, maybe we can do some gold needles. The problem with gold is that the metal is soft, and it's easy to break it. And so I'd have, or, or, or bend it so it's not usable. So I'd have the patient buy their own needles, take them home with them, and bring them to me like that, so that's their needles. But if, if, if I destroy a needle, that's you know, 15 bucks gone, because at that time, that's how much one needle cost. Um, which, and that's only because if I get them in quantity, you know, that, that's expensive. But the, the, no one makes them anymore. Yeah, so um, zinc needles are used, sometimes carpet needles, but I haven't noticed any difference in those. The, the iron needles, which is the stainless steel, I think work the best. So I use a needle that has a wound handle that's made of silver. Does that 
Yeah. yeah. What's, what's that? Sorry. What does the wound handle the silver? My name is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. What does that so, do for the? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it helps the electromagnetic flow. May, maybe less we know. With, with, a, with a silver needle on the iron. Silver and gold are not magnetic, so I don't know how it could affect on the chi. Yeah, that, that's a good. Well, maybe it's something invasive in there. So, because you can affect the chi by pressure with your finger. So, you can push on the point. So. Uh, l let's back that up a second, and then let's ask that one question first, though. The, the question is um, silver and, and iron together. Would that? That could be magnetic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the needles I use have a, a the handle of the needle is uh, wound silver, and I feel that those work best. So the handle is silver, but the body, the needle itself, is iron. Did you ever try picking up one of those needles with a magnet? No. The needle can pick pick up. I don't know about the handle. Yeah. Okay, so this 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 did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's three ways to stimulate an acupuncture point. We can find an acupuncture point really easy. Just go on the back of your hand, go about two inches on the back, there's a, there's a hollow there, and pretty easy to find. You know, that, that's a major acupuncture point there, right there. There's three ways to stimulate an acupuncture point. One is with manipulation. And that's called, take a guess, acupressure, there you go, acupressure. The second is with a needle, that's acupuncture, and the third is with heat, that's called moxibustion. So uh, stimulating a point with heat is not uncommon, it's, although I, 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 I'll only do it if I really have to because it creates a lot of smoke, and what you do is you burn a sp very specific herb on the point in a draw in it it's different than putting a heating pad it's not the same if I just put a, a heating pad over my arm and heat it up it's not going to do the same thing if I take a little ball of um, mugwort and put it on the skin and, and light it and it'll burn down as soon as it hits the skin it gets hot and I take it off then do another one keep doing that and that'll force the heat right into that one spot so that's, those are the three ways to stimulate a point with heat with Needle in with pressure. All right, so let's make a little more space here. So In the beginning, there wasn't anything, right? Then there was something in the container for that something at the same time. That's yang and that's yin, right? And the relationship between those two is qi. My personal definition, I already told you what my personal definition for qi is. Consciousness. Yeah. Not, not the mind. Consciousness. Right. So now... When you have this balloon that you're squeezing and one side gets big and one side gets less, the, the theory, we go from nothing, nothing at all is called wuji. Um, wuji with a J-I. Wu means not any. When I said there wasn't anything, there wasn't anything at all, right? That's wuji, right? And then from wuji you have the expansive principle and the containment principle, and that's called Taiji. Right? So all way too often you see Taiji written with a CHI, T A I, C H I, right? Right? So going back to how you pronounce the Chinese language, this Tai Chi is incorrect. Although there are places in southern China. Um, where they pronounce the J-I like a C-H-I, but that's, that's analogous to me saying ka, right, when it's really car, or close to that, I think, right? Tai, Tai means what? The great. And G means restriction. It's the same thing, Tai G here. 
is, is, is this, right? This is, the, we have not any restriction, Wuji, not any restriction, that's, that's not anything. And that, then we have Taiji, which is the great restriction, and this is this universe that has a container, right? And there's this expansive principle and containment principle that's existing at all levels within that universe. So, let's see, we'll go to, um, So the, the, uh, the, the theory is, is that the entire universe is just chi. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about here, you, you can spend the next four years studying in depth. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just giving you little bits and pieces within that. The entire universe is full, is chi. So everything is chi. I'm chi. You're chi. The chair is chi. The light's chi. Right? The building is chi. The trees are chi. Everything is chi. That's really chi. That's really what? It's really chi. Chi? Yes, it's really chi. So what differentiates different phenomena is the degree of condensation. All right? When she is compressed, the more she is compressed, the more we are able to recognize matter. And the more she is dispersed, we recognize space. So even though there is this seemingly empty space between us, is it really empty? No, it's full of um, molecules, atoms. You've got oxygen, nitrogen, and a few other things in there. Right? But we can't see them. So, so this, the, the, the more chi is compressed, the more we recognize matter. So, as a simple formula, the body itself, which appears to be a compressed entity, well, I didn't tell you which was yin and yang. The more compressed something is, the more yin it is. Right? So the body which is compressed then is yin. The mind, which is, where's the mind? So if I'm here and you're there and we can see each other, but, you're, but we're, there's a distance between us, does that mean our minds are this big? No. Your perception is that big, but your mind isn't that big. Yeah. So the only way to know is to um, practice, is to practice being still and allowing your awareness to merge with your breath and go to the edge of the universe. So, believe it or not, there's a lot of peace in that, and it's an ingredient that's kind of missing within the realm of human existence right now. Yeah. So un unless, as a species, we learn how to find a greater degree of peace and harmony within our relationships, that um, we're not going in the right direction. We haven't even found harmony with the planet. Right? I like this, this physicist at Oxford named um, David Deutsch. And, uh, oh, you've got, <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's right, a prolific author. And um, I'm not saying I agree with him, but I, I, I like the way he phrased it. He, he says that, What's, what's looking for enlightenment is the earth. The earth is an organism. And the earth is looking for enlightenment. And so the earth needs help. And what she does is she keeps spawning creatures to help her. Ultimately, we're, we're just part of the earth. The earth has spawned us. 
And throughout history, when, when she realizes that this organism is not going to help fi her find enlightenment, she'll rid herself of it. Interesting uh, way of putting things. OK, so where were we just now? Yeah, Wuji and Taiji. So Taiji and is basically yin and yang, right? And the ancient way of defining yin and yang was with a straight line and a dotted line. This is yang and this is yin. And so remember with this, this figure here, the, it's the yin-yang symbol, the two fish swimming into each other. This means that yin and yang are always together, right? And this means that within, this here is yang, within this yang there's yin, right? And this one here is yin, and within this yin there's yang, right? So the way this comes out is that this is a yang here, but within that yang there's a yang and a yin. Within this yin over here, there's a yang and a yin. And this keeps going on and on, on. This This yang here contains within it a yang and a yin. This yin here contains within it a yang and a yin. This yang contains a yang and a yin. And this one here contains a yang and a yin. We have th three levels of manifestation here. We're going from Wuji to Taiji. Now at this third level, we're calling this Bagua. We're calling the third level Bagua. B-A-G-U-A, Bagua. And what we do is we, 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 stop, we stop at this third level, and we, we, um, we create a diagrams. So you see this, this yang here? We have a yang, a yang, and a yang. So that's three yangs right here, right? One, two, three. We have a, a yin, yang, yang here, right? So we have a yin, yang, yang. We have a yang, yin, yang, like that. Anyone tell me what comes next? This one here, yin, yin, yang, right? Yin, yin, yang, right? And what, what comes next here? Yang, yang, yin. Yang, yang, yin, like that. And then what comes next here? Yin, yang, yin. All right, yin, yang, yin. And then what comes next here? Yang, yin, yin, like that. And then what comes last? Okay, so now, now we're getting deeper into the philosophy, of, or into Chinese medical philosophy. And so what you have here, you have eight possibilities here. All right? this, is, this is called, the ba means eight, and gua means trigram or diagram. So you have eight diagrams. These eight here represent uh, eight matrices of energy that we have on this plane here. This number eight is so fundamental to uh, this philosophy and to Chinese medicine that everything revolves around this eight. So for two things. What do, what do you have here? You have here a flow chart, right? Flow chart, right? And the number eight, where do you see the number eight? Where do you see the number eight? Again, you still, who, who's in the computer science? How, how many, uh, what's a bit? Does it show up in computers? Number eight. Number eight is significant because it's two cubed. And a computer, the technology that underlies the original computers anyways, and things might be changing, is binary system. Binary system is zero, one. Or maybe in this case, one, two. Right? And you cube that, two times two times two is eight. So in your body, right, now, I want you to start thinking about your body in this way. Eight. How do you divide the body into eight? So, I'm standing here. I have a front half, a front piece. 
I have a back piece, that's two. Right? If I put a line down here and say now I have a left and I have a right, that's four. And if I divide the body in half, right where the navel is, that, then I have four above and four below. That's eight. You know, so when I first heard this concept, I had trouble actualizing it in my own mind, right? And then one day I was chopping potatoes, and I just took the potato and I went, oh, one, two, and that's it. So as far as your own perception of your own body in space and time, so that you're not disorganized from your body, and so that the mind and the body uh, beginning to work as an integrated whole, you begin by seeing yourself as an integrated whole, and you can do that, you can begin to do that by seeing your, the physical body within these eight pieces. Follow that? Say it one more time, please. Yeah. So, in order for you to have a greater sense of an integrated self, mind and body, you can begin by seeing, your, seeing the eight pieces that we just mentioned, okay? There's a front half, there's a back half, that's two. There's a left and there's a right, that's three, four. So I got this one corner in the front here, one corner in the back here, one corner here, one corner back here. Then we divide in the half, right where the navel is. And there's four pieces above and four pieces below. And it's, it's easy for me to say this, but it's actually easier for you if you take a potato. I, I've been teaching this for a long time now, and I, if you take a potato and cut it like that. Right? So the purpose of this is so that you can have a greater sense of the integrated aspect of what you are, so that your mind and body are not going in different directions. So at the heart of Chinese medicine, beyond acupuncture, beyond moxibustion or acupressure, beyond diet and all that stuff, is being able to have a perception of yourself as an integrated whole. That the mind, the body, and the breath are together as one unit. Okay? So what does that mean? That means um, I go out for a run, and I'm running, and, and I'm thinking about work, I'm thinking about relationships, I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for dinner. No, no, no. It's a great opportunity to bring the mind, the body, and the breath together. So you're running. So as I'm running, I'm inhaling, and I'm having a sense of the air coming in and the air going out. I'm not thinking my mind is incorporated into my body as I'm doing this exercise. You know, I cringe when I see a, the gyms and the people riding the bikes watching the news. You don't need the news. You know, it, it, actually, if you don't listen to the news for a month and then you go back to it, you're going to say, nothing's changed. It's true. It really is true. And um, taking a break from the news is a good idea, actually. Yeah. So the idea of health in, in this form of medicine is to begin to begin bringing an integrated awareness of these three things. Okay, so um, sometimes when the mind and the body are separate, you have a strong feeling, and how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that feeling? Or you might deal with that feeling by eating, you might deal with that feeling by having a beer, or smoking a joint, something like that. And what you're doing is you're just driving the mind and the body away from each other again. You know, so what's happening in the mind and the body are not two separate things. They're, they're one thing. And if you're not paying attention to the stresses that are arising within the mind or the body, if you're not paying attention, then those stresses themselves act as tension that push the mind and the body away from each other even further. Right? You follow that? You know? And that's why exercise has been an important part of Chinese culture for 2,000 years, ever since Huateau 
uh, Hua to, to China is like Hippocrates uh, to the West. So Hua to lived in the second century and he talked about the need for exercise and the right kind of exercise to maintain good health. Now when I went to school we did not have physical education class and then I was I think I was in fourth grade and suddenly they brought the notice home and John Kennedy President Kennedy uh, created this thing, the um, President's Council on Physical Fitness, and we had to have gym class twice a week and had to go to school in these days with sneakers. And that's where PE started. And it started because of research in the 1950s that showed a definitive relationship between sedentary lifestyle and heart disease. And they said, oh, we need to move around. So. The body, we said before, is yang or yin. It's compressed. It's compressed. It's yin. So we're always using yin and yang. We're always using yin and yang as complements. So for instance, it's cold outside. So cold is yin, and I, I'm, I'm feeling cold. Right? So if I want to put some food into my body, I want to put some yang into my body not yin. So I want to eat foods that are yang because it's cold. Cold is yin. Right? We want to warm it up with yang. So a yang food would be like cinnamon or ginger. Um, okay, thank you. Cinnamon or ginger or chicken. Chicken is yang. Root vegetables are yang. You don't want to put yin in your, in your body. So yin foods would be like raw foods, like salad. Any, any raw food would be yin. Um, or mint. Mint is yin. Like that. So as a simple complement to maintaining health of the body, because the body itself is compressed in its yin, you add something yang to it, and yang is activity. Right? The mind, which is yang because it's expanded, and I, I do believe the mind is expanded beyond what our senses tell us, Right? The mind which is expanded is yang. You bring something yin to it to keep the mind healthy. And yin is stillness. That's why you practice stillness. You practice stillness you know, for one thing, for the health of the mind. You practice physical activity for the health of the body. They go together. So now you've got mindfulness, which is a good thing. It's creeped into our society and our culture and our medical systems. And you've got neuroscience studying, you know, mechanisms hitherto unknown about how the mind and the brain work. Um, but mindfulness has certainly creeped into the culture. And mindfulness is just, yes, yes you have a question. Speak up again. The important concept in Taoism is like our present moment and our thoughts, and if we are our thoughts. Would you fit in the thoughts in the mind, mind, body, breath? Okay. Like Let me answer that question first. Let me answer that question first. We're all born here from parents, from mother. How are you connected to your mother? In the womb. In the womb. Umbilical cord, right? My umbilical cord was connected to my mommy, right? She had an umbilical cord that was connected to her mother. In, all the way back to where? Where? How, how soon? Did, did we evolve from bacteria? Yeah. Quite possibly, right? So do, does the umbilical cord that connected me to my mother go all the way back to that bacteria? So when, when did life begin? If the universe is 13 billion years old, that's when we began. You know, you might be 20 years old now, but you really began 13 billion years ago. No? What's that? I'm not making <laughs> Okay, so repeat the question again. Um, as our, we are our thoughts, um, would it fit into... Okay, let's stop right there a sec. Stop right there. So. In order for you to have been here, you needed two parents. They needed two parents. In order for that tree to be out there, it needed parents. So there's this process 
of cellular cells come together and divide, cells come together and divide, cells come together and divide, right? Within our, what we are here, right, that division, the terminal point of that division is our thoughts. And why is it? How is that so? What, what, what happens? There is uh, an energy that's been around since the beginning. This is Tao. This is a Tao now. The energy has been around since the beginning of time, right, that continues to divide, divide, divide. And when it, its last division within you is not only your thought, but your ability to perceive that thought. And every time you have a thought, you're having that thought, but you are the witness to that thought. So you're walking back to your dorm, or you're driving home, and you're sitting there, and you're talking to yourself. You're really thinking things. When, when you're thinking about things, you're talking to yourself. And, and who's doing the talking, and who's doing the listening? OK, so when you practice being still, when you practice being still, and your awareness just merges with the air to the furthest corners of the universe, thinking stops. Your thoughts stop. And if you can allow that to happen long enough, then you begin to perceive, not in your thoughts, because it, the experience can't be explained, you begin to perceive a deeper reality. Right? This is Buddhism. So, you know, Buddha, is, uh, he spends so many years out in the desert looking for whatever, and then uh, he says, I'm not going to move until I figure it out. He sits down for a week. He says, oh, yeah, that's it. So what does he say? The first thing he says that all you are are your thoughts, right? So that, that which arises with your thoughts becomes lost because the, that energy, as it arises, boom, it becomes two, right? Okay, there, there is something that arises with your thoughts and boom, it becomes two. Once it becomes two, right, that which arises with the thoughts is lost. I'm answering your question in, in, in a very deep way. I want you to remember that. So the practice of meditation is finding a place where there are no thoughts. And what that, when that happens, I can give you some information about what neuroscience has been teaching us now. Is that the mind cycles at a certain frequency, right? The brain does, cycles at a certain frequency. When you get into the deepest level of, in your brain, um, right now it could be between 20 and 40 hertz. Hertz is the, the cycles, right? So when you get very relaxed, it could go down to 15. When you're very, very relaxed, it goes down to 10, right? When you get into the deepest state of meditation, it goes down to four, right? It only goes down to four in your deepest sleep, stage four sleep. So, and you might get stage four sleep for a total of 20 minutes a night. So your, 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 uh, your physiology goes through stage one, two, three, four, and then goes back up, right? And stage four is called, is deep sleep. And that's where your body repairs itself. In stage four sleep, that's when the brain starts cycling at four hertz. It's the, um, the glial cells in your, in your brain turn from being assistants to neurotransmitters to be, being little brooms. And what it does is it sweeps out the, um, the free radicals that accumulate in your head. In our head, we've got these neurons that fire between 5 and 20 times per second. Right? Think, about, think about a spark firing just even 5 times a second, you know, in one second, boom, 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 boom. Right? And you've got how many billion? And that's happening every second inside your head, these sparks. So that creates what's called free radicals. So free radicals are toxins um, in the environment. So you might hear of free radical scavengers, or like vitamin C helps to rid the body of free radicals. The brain has a hard time ridding itself of free radicals because so much is happening at compressed space. So when your brain cycles down to 4 hertz in stage 4 sleep, boom, you, you, you get a a dump of those free radicals into the bloodstream so it can bring, it can be cured. Same thing happens if you can practice meditating and reach the point where you can get to 4 hertz, you can do the exact same thing. It will take you 20 years to do that. So now you're learning, you're going to school for a few years, you're going to learn a few things, you start meditating now, and in 20 years you'll get it. 
and then after that you'll have plenty of life, and you'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. Another question. So you, you did a nice job of explaining the philosophy. Yeah. Can we go back to the data for a moment? To the what? To the data. Yeah. Yeah. And the electromagnetic. Yeah. Field. Yeah. So. With, yeah. So a question about that. Oh, the, the, whether it's a needle, heat, or manual pressure, it's doing something to in, influence the, an increased flow in that channel. There's a disruption. Yeah, it's a disruption. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Arthur McHarris, thank you for okay. introducing us to Chief. <laughs>